I'm going to tell you just um, a little bit about what the Institute does. We do an awful lot, but I'll try and squeeze as much as I can into a short space of time. So as you've heard from Fran, our overall mission is to improve health and reduce health inequalities locally, nationally, and internationally. And the reason that we're interested in health inequalities is that even within Scotland, there's a 13 year difference in life expectancy between the most affluent and most deprived. And that difference is evident even at a very small level. So if you look within Glasgow, then for every subway stop east, what you find is that life expectancy falls by two years. So this has huge impact on people's lives. And the problem is that even the best intentioned health interventions that are effective can inadvertently increase health inequalities. So this is a study we did a few years back. It looks at the back to sleep campaign to reduce cot deaths, where we found that um, babies who were born into countries where culturally they were put on their backs to sleep had a lower risk of cot death. So there's a huge health education campaign telling uh, mums to put their babies down to sleep that way. And what happened was in the most affluent parts of society, they got it straight away. It took another 20 years for the most deprived groups to have the same level of effect. So it was a hugely effective intervention, but did inadvertently increase health inequalities. So if you want to achieve a double whammy and actually improve health and reduce health inequalities, you need to make sure that you deliver the right intervention to the right people in the right way. And that means you need to understand the underlying causes of disease, not just the biological and genetic causes, but also behaviors and what drives behaviors. And you also need to be aware that people are not lab rats. They live in a society where they're influenced by a lot of other issues, a lot of other competing um, commitments on their time. So you need to think about whether interventions are easy to adopt, whether they have a cost attached, whether they need a time commitment, whether you need to opt in, whether you need to understand anything and bear that in mind when you're developing the intervention. And so how do you uh, stop yourself from producing an intervention which actually doesn't answer the question or doesn't answer it correctly? Well, we've taken a, a completely novel approach to this. We have a very multidisciplinary institute that brings together people who have different types of expertise and different perspectives. And very importantly, brings together social scientists and health scientists. So the people that understand behavior together with the people that understand health. And all of our research is focused around three big themes, understanding what causes health and health inequalities, developing interventions to improve health, and then underpinning that with data. And we've had advice from international experts that have confirmed that this approach is cutting edge and completely novel. So to give you some examples, football fans in training, we know that obesity is a huge problem in society. In Scotland, more than three quarters of men are obese, but the problem is that the traditional approaches, so things like Weight Watchers, rely on um, focusing on diet. And we know that that just doesn't appeal to men who think that dieting is for women. So they don't adopt those sorts of interventions. So what we did was a completely novel approach, actually used um, football clubs where men already have a huge amount of loyalty to deliver the intervention. And they did you know, educate people about diet, but there's also a huge focus on exercise. They were group sessions with a lot of banter. Um, the participants took part in training with the club coach and there were reunions and it was hugely effective at reducing waist circumference and weight loss and that effect was maintained. And it's been expanded since then. So within um, sport, it's expanded um, in football throughout Scotland. It's expanded in football beyond Scotland in the UK and other countries. And then in other sports, it's been adopted by rugby, by Aussie rules and ice hockey in Canada. And we've used similar approaches out with sport. So for example, um, we do a lot of work with Africa where we've taken advantage of the, of the fact that people have a huge loyalty to churches the vast majority of South Africans go to church um, and half of them, or if not more, go regularly. And now we've introduced um, health promoting interventions that are actually delivered by the churches. So another example is active commuting. We know that almost half of adults don't meet UK physical activity guidelines. It costs the NHS huge amounts of money. And if you ask people why, they say the problem is lack of time. 
So commuting really kills two birds with one stone because you don't need to find extra time to exercise. You have to commute anyway, or at least you did before COVID. Um, and what you can do is exercise during commuting. Now, the problem is that the cycle to work scheme, where there's been a huge amount of money invested, just assume that people don't commute because they don't have bikes. But in reality, that's not the problem. The vast majority of people have a bike and it's sitting in the shed going rusty. So what we've done is actually link up with British Cycling to actually do the social science research to understand why it is that people don't cycle. And it's more to do with concerns around safety, to do with practical and logistic issues. So we're now working with British Cycling to actually develop interventions that address those real underlying problems. We also work with other partners, such as local authorities and urban town planners. So we know that access to green space, does, space doesn't just improve your physical health, it also improves your mental health as well. So if you have access to green space within the urban environment, this bar chart at the bottom shows cortisol levels. These are stress hormones in people and having access to green space can reduce your level of stress and it actually reduces it more in people in deprived communities. The reason being that if you're affluent, you can always get in your car and go elsewhere to places to take exercise. But if you're in a deprived community, the environment on your doorstep is quite often the only environment you have access to. So it improves health overall and it reduces health inequalities. We also know that alcohol retail outlets, there are far more, they're far more common in very deprived areas deliberately. Um, and what we've done is work with um, the licensing authorities to ensure that they don't just consider economic factors when deciding whether to renew licenses, but also consider health impact. We do an awful lot of work globally. I've mentioned Africa. We also work, for example, example with South America, where there are huge health inequalities. And we're working with them to evaluate a couple of their interventions, which are really quite interesting, because what they do is piggyback social security type interventions with health interventions. So people who are deprived, um, don't have good access to housing and so on, are offered um, additional help with benefits, access to low cost housing, but it's conditional on them taking up vaccination, antenatal screening, etc. cetera. Um, and what we're doing is evaluating those interventions in terms of impact on health. So as Fran mentioned, not surprisingly, a huge amount of effort over the last year has been focused on COVID research. And I'll just give you a few examples of that. Um, COVID has had um, impacts on health inequalities over and above those which already existed. We know that whether you look at deprivation in terms of education level or the type of area you live, what you find is people who are most deprived have had higher risk of getting um, severe COVID a higher risk of needing hospitalization and higher risk of dying. It's also introduced other types of health inequalities. Uh, we've been able to show that people of, um, in older age groups are far more uh, at a far higher risk of adverse outcomes from COVID, needing admission to hospital and dying from COVID. And that some of that excess risk comes from other risk factors, such as the fact that they're more likely to have other health conditions, but there's quite a lot of excess risk on top of that. Another area in which their health inequalities relates to ethnic group. So we have shown along with others that people who are South Asian and black have a far higher risk of having severe COVID infections and needing to go into hospital or die. And that isn't entirely explained by lifestyle There's some innate um, risk beyond that. Um, the other th another area that you may not have heard about, and this is a totally novel study um, on learning disabilities, We've done a huge study comparing adults in Scotland with learning disabilities with other people and showing that people with learning disabilities are more likely to be infected with COVID and have worse outcomes when they become infected. Overall, they're two and a half times more likely to die, but the highest risk is actually not among the highest group, it's among people who are below 65 years of age. And this research study that the Institute did led directly to the Scottish and UK governments changing their vaccination strategy to offer vaccination earlier in lower age groups among people with learning disabilities. We've also um, fed into government policy in other ways. Um, right at the beginning of the pandemic, there was a different approach taken in Asian countries from European and um, American countries. So in Asia, because they had SARS previously, they had a lot more preparation in place. 
they were able to offer testing much earlier on and they had a more compliant population that was willing to accept greater monitoring and, and enforcement. Whereas in Europe and the UK, they went for a two-pronged approach where they had general population measures such as social distancing and face coverings, along with targeted um, shielding of people who were judged to be clinically extremely vulnerable. And there was a lot of discussion in government around whether you could just rely on screen and on shielding of this subgroup and let the virus run rip through the general population. So we were able to do a study that showed that in actual fact, there were people who had other risk factors, such as being over 70, having heart disease and so on, that actually increased their risk just as much as being in the clinically extremely vulnerable groups. And they're also much more common in the general population. And as a result, these other risk factors actually were contributing to more admissions to hospital and more deaths. And you would actually need to shield around a third of the population if you're going to avoid the vast majority of admissions to hospital and deaths. And that just isn't feasible. So prior to vaccination, we had to keep in place physical distancing. So all these studies are feeding directly into government policy. We're now about to start a hugely ambitious project looking at long COVID. Um, this is the biggest study of its kind. It covers the whole of Scotland. It's not a selected population like previous studies, so not just people going into hospital. So every adult who's ever had a test for COVID and that's been positive will be recruited along with a comparison group. And they will be followed up through a self-completed questionnaire every six months for up to two years after their infection. We will have linkage to all of their routine health records and a subgroup of them will have um, interviews. And this uh, new study is about to be launched by the Scottish government uh, next month. So in terms of why we need a new building, at the moment, um, in theory, we occupy 10 buildings across Glasgow. In reality, we occupy 350 individual houses and flats at the moment, but normally it's 10 buildings across Glasgow, um, six miles apart. So whilst we work very hard to have this multidisciplinary um, approach, there are obviously logistic problems to delivering that and being co-located in a single building will make it so much easier. We want our new building to be something completely different. We want to make sure we use our own research in how the building works. It reflects our values and it's consistent with the University of Glasgow being a civic university. So the actual building will support the physical and mental well-being of um, both the people who work there and the people who visit. We'll have stairs more visible than lifts. We'll have uh, facilities that support active commuting, indoor green space and natural light. It's an environmentally friendly building. The ground floor is completely publicly accessible. Anybody can come into it. We have a social enterprise cafe that's not for profit with affordable healthy food. It'll be inclusive, um, physically inclus inclusive and inclusive um, to people with learning disabilities. There will be public engagement and exhibition um, and knowledge exchange events on the ground floor. And we will also have space for a community hub. So as with our research, we want our building to be something different and better. So thank you very much. My name is Emma McIntosh. Um, as as um, I was introduced earlier, I'm a professor of health economics here at the University of Glasgow. So I'm going to spend about 10 minutes talking to you. First of all, I was reminded to tell everybody what health economics is, first of all, and our role in, at IHW. And then I'm going to talk about a new research grant, quantum engineering quantum imaging for remote monitoring of well-being and disease in communities. And then I'm just going to have a couple of minutes at the end talking about research culture at the University of Glasgow. So first of all, health economics. Well, here at Glasgow, in addition to much of the clinical and public health research going on at IHW, and often not known to many, um, we have a very large group of around about 20 specialist researchers in health economics and health technology assessment. And basically, where research is being conducted into the effectiveness of, say, a new drug or an intervention, what we do is we add in the cost effectiveness element. It's quite a scientific endeavor in itself with regards to the, the, the methods and the analyses that we use. And basically, these days, as we all know, it's not really enough to just know whether a drug or a treatment is effective. Policymakers need to know the costs involved, the quality of life outcomes. And these additional data help us to decide whether a new drug or treatment is also cost effective. So our team, so here's some of the handbooks that we've developed as part of the Oxford University Press series, 
Handbooks in Health Economics. And actually this book here on the far right, that's just literally been published a few months ago. So I'm going to talk about this new multidisciplinary research grant awarded to us. Um, it's just about to start June 2021. It's funded by the EPSRC, the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council. Um, entitled Quantum Imaging for Remote Monitoring Wellbeing Disease. Now, I'm not a physicist, so please don't ask me any questions on physics at the end. So this is a highly multidisciplinary team from Glasgow University. Um, the team in, include biomedical engineers, can, cardiovascular scientists, cognitive neuroimaging specialists, systems engineering, computing science, physics, astronomy, and from IHW, general practice and primary care researchers, and from our team, the health economics and health technology assessment researchers. So our vision for 2050 builds upon the NHS long-term plan to transform the delivery of care, promote aging well, and use current wearable technologies um, in their assessment of patients. So we want the National Health Service to remain a world leading healthcare system in 2050. So we need to invest in developing novel and unobtrusive community sensing. This is a very futuristic grant. So what is quantum imaging? Well, it's described as it was described as a breakthrough by scientists when it was first discovered a few years ago. It's basically uh, this science enables us to take images at distance with much greater sensitivity and resolution than ever before. So our team of engineers at the University of Glasgow are proposing that by using infrared wavelengths invisible to the eye, we can remotely image inside the body to monitor, for example, vascular health through measurements of blood flow. And in the coming decades, we'll also be able to image inside the brain while people go about their normal activities and in their home. So clinical me measurements from household members, so just walking around your home, will, the, the, the sensors will pick up measurements um, and they'll be processed and analysed and we'll be able to look, explore well-being and health impacts by looking at the predictors for early onset of disease or to assess, for example, levels of pain. So this image on the top left here is a proof of, proof of concept data um, from our engineers and it shows optical measurements real time and at distance from the camera shown on the right hand side. So essentially, um, this image actually in the bottom, the bottom right hand side is a ghost image of a person in their home analysed with our current artificial intelligence. So this grant is really a, a hugely interdisciplinary effort. Um, we've got engineers, neuroscientists, health economists, clinical um, expertise and so on. And this is very futuristic and we're hoping that by carrying out this research, we can inform transformative healthcare in the future. Yeah, so our primary scientific challenge is to develop groundbreaking methods for imaging and sensing that can continuous, continuously assess health by measuring individuals' physiological, mental and emotional well-being. So we want to identify changes that are clinically relevant so that we can use our health data to predict future critical events such as falls or strokes. And this will help us to inform and enable timely intervention, treatments or drug use. So alongside our Glasgow University engineers and neuroscientists, we have Institute of Health and Wellbeing academics and health economists. So our clinical academics will provide the clinical interpretation of the health data that are being picked up by these in-home sensors, as well as facilitating important public and patient involvement in the design. And our health economists will use a range of methods to explore the cost effectiveness of these intelligent, smart environments. So we will use economic experiments, to understand public preferences and gain behavioural insights in order to predict the acceptability of the technology and the likely behaviour change and resulting health impacts that will arise. Okay, so that's enough physics for one day. So I just want to have a couple of minutes here at the very end. So the, the team had asked me to talk a little bit about research culture. And this is a topic very close to my heart. So I worked at Oxford University for 11 years in our, in our health economics team there. And when I moved to Glasgow, the one thing that struck me was 
this very collegiate behaviour that, that goes on that we maybe take for granted at Glasgow, but it really isn't happening elsewhere. It's certainly we, in Oxford, we very much worked in our silos. But I want to talk about the culture. So we have got, we've got a new post, which I think embodies this interdisciplinarity and this research culture that we have developed at Glasgow. So we're just advertising actually at the moment, a very exciting post in One Health Economics. So what we're One Health, when we talk about One Health, what we mean is the integration of the ecosystem health, animal health and human health and well-being. So the idea of our new post in One Health is to make a leading contribution to bridging research between the Institute of Health and Wellbeing's research themes and the Institute of Biodiversity Animal Health. So just to make this a bit clearer, we envisage One Health as this umbrella term where we, where we explore animal health, zoonotic infections, um, food safety, bacterial infections, all of these things are underneath the same umbrella as human health. And this is very relevant just now when you think about the pandemic situation that we've all been in for the last 12 months. This also brings in climate change research, where change, the environment's changing, the climate's changing, this will impact on our ecosystem and impact um, transmission of diseases and so on. And this also fits very well with our, um, with our global health work that's going on. So I wanted to make this point. So we're advertising for this post just now in One Health. It's a One Health lecturer. And we've had so many people asking about this post and this role. And um, just this week, I was talking to a potential candidate. And she said, for me, she was based um, down south in Bristol, I think Bristol or Cambridge. She said, Glasgow, for me, is, is the place to be for interdisciplinary research. Everyone else talks about it, but Glasgow actually does it, which I thought that was I thought that was really nice. And it's funny because it really represented how I felt when I moved to Glasgow and started working in an interdisciplinary environment. So that was um, that was my that was my insight onto into research culture at Glasgow.